Welcome to our webinar, Breach Response Components, What You Need to Know and Why. My name is Carlos Leva. I'm a CEO of Three Alliance Publishing, the publisher of the Hippos File Guide. I'm also attorney and managing partner with Digital Business Law Group, PA. We're going to run this webinar like we run all our um, webinars. Uh, Martin Nguyen, our director of operations for Hippos Rival Guide and Digital Business Law Group, will be trolling the um, chat for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, then please uh, direct them to that um, question box, and Martin will stop me at the, at the appropriate time, or I will ask him uh, when I catch a breath. If there are any questions, and then we'll take questions at the end as well. So here's today's agenda. We're going to do a short introduction, discuss the following response components, preparedness, breach notification plan, response teams, uh, and testing. We're spending a lot of time with response teams because that's really where, where, where the heart of the matter lies. But if you're going to talk about managing a response and the components thereof, you really got to backtrack and talk about incidents because obviously if you're not manage, managing incidents correctly, how you ever going to respond correctly. So it all starts with the management of incidents. We're going to talk about the importance of methodology and like any other sort of new field, um, we have some definitions so that uh, we can create a, a grammar by which we can talk about these things. Uh, even though people have been responding to breaches for quite some time now, uh, it's still fairly new. I don't think, at least I'm not aware of any, um, you know, standardized methodologies. There are some best practices that are starting to develop. I think the insurance companies are starting to get in on the game. And so it's an evolving space, but it's still rather young. So. Here are our learning objectives. We don't provide a foundational understanding of responding to breaches by reviewing one response component. Postmortem, what do you do after the breach? What do you do after the response? How you manage incidents, which means how do you figure out when breach notification is triggered? Uh, talk about cyber insurance and where we believe that that may be headed. Um, and again, understanding the lingo. So it's all about data breaches and data breach response. And an effective response requires coordination of its uh, clear. Carlos? Yes. Do you have the slides up? Oh, I do have the slides up. I'm sorry. You should have queued me in a long time ago because I, I need to share my screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry. Where? No one can see your screen. Yes, I know, but I would like to share it. Do you see it now? We see it now. Oh, sorry. Apologize for that. Martin is uh, usually on me for things like that. He, he missed the beat there. So I'm well, I, I thought I thought you were doing a different lead in, and anything's possible. But once you start talking about stuff, um, I, I, I knew you. I had to step in. Yeah, very good, very good. You called me early. That's that's good. Uh, or the audience did. I, yes, one or the other. Um, so an effective response requires coordination of a spare set of individuals and teams. That's the really big deal. How you coordinate between those, what who who what what the teams are, what their roles are, who manages the teams, etc. Preparation. Uh, you, you need to have. Um, you know, you prepare for, and we're trying to develop, and we are going to be developing for our subscribers, a breach notification, a breach response framework. And that breach response framework is not going to be limited to only protected health information. Because if you're in healthcare, you may also have a breach of personally identifiable information. You may have a breach of payment information. You may have a breach of, you know, uh, other kinds of, regulated information and so we're trying to create something uh, around what we call sensitive data that would help you um, as a health, as a covered entity or as a business associate even if you have a different kind of breach. The responses are not all that dissimilar. The initial analysis and obviously the applicable law uh, will be different. Um, 
And then we talked about the the importance of incidents, right? And you have to keep in mind that an incident is not a breach, uh, at least in the HIPAA space. Uh, and I think this is a, a, a valid definition, um, best practices across what, what, what I'm calling for today, sensitive data, is it's an attempted or, or successful unauthorized access, use, disclosure, modification, or destruction of information or interference with the system. In other words, an attempt or success, both, both count as incidents, and both should be logged. And obviously, one is treated in a different way. One requires a response. An attempt uh, doesn't require an, uh, a, a, a breach notification response because it wasn't successful, but you still need to log the incident, and you still need to analyze it, figure out whether it uh, was triggered or not. And I'm trying to click the slides here, so they're letting me go to the next slide. I'm not sure why. There we go. So we're going to talk a lot about teams. Almost everything non-trivial that happens in the business world, as many of you know, and in many other walks of life, is the result of a project executed by a team. Here we have a team of teams, and uh, the coordination of which is the really, really hard thing. Okay? You know, it's often hard getting things done with within teams, because a lot of times individuals within the team have a different view of what the problem is. Now we have that uh, in order of magnitude more complex because we got a team of teams that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how you test the response plan. Obviously, it's like a disaster re recovery plan. There's all testing is along a continuum, but you want to do some sort of test that you have the right players, who's going to be the general manager, what's the communication strategy. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be pulling your hair out uh, and when your hair is on fire, trying to figure these things out on the fly or trying to identify some forensic specialist on the fly or trying to identify. And in many cases, you may have to not only identify these partners, um, but draft contracts with them. Right, who are you going to use, for example, um, you know, for fraud detection and fraud insurance and all that? Is, is it going to be, you know, the the, us, the, the usual sucks, uh, suspects that play in that space? If so, you know, it's much better to have a relationship, uh, a relationship with them up front. You're probably going to get a better deal. You're going to be more familiar with what they can do for you. Uh, what they can't do, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Then it's really important post-mortem to identify not only how you remediate the breach, okay, how do you fix that, how do you remediate that from a cybersecurity perspective, but a post-mortem on the response itself, how you can get better at responding, right? You're not, you're not likely to have just one breach uh, during an organization's lifetime. Okay, and organizations that haven't had a breach, it's only a question of when now. Okay, with, with WannaCry, with Petya, you know, you're going to see a, um, I, I think you're going to see in 2018 a tsunami of ransomware attacks just because this is, this is the way things are going. The global economy could be doing better. It's not, it's not growing as fast as we would like. We've got a lot of talented people in the world and not enough jobs. For lots of reasons, I'm sort of going on the record saying you're going to see a lot more happening in, in 2018 with respect to ransomware. Now, with respect to breach response, recently having conversations with uh, insurers, and I guess uh, they're getting, getting into the game, I believe, as part of their coverage. So if anybody out there has cyber insurance coverage and um, wants to uh, weigh in here regarding whether as part of your insurance contract, the insurance company itself has said they're going to step in and manage uh, the response. And I believe that that may be an emerging trend as well. So, you know, this is um, preaching to the choir, but like everything else in life, you know, it's all about blocking and tackling and, and being prepared. So you got to have a preparedness plans, a response plan, or in the case of our subscribers, modify the one that we're going to provide to you, 
okay, to suit your organization and your partners, et cetera, et cetera. Now, as part of the Digital Business Law Group, we're actually going to launch a practice where we will come in and re help you with the response, function as the general manager with already existing relationships with forensics teams, with, um, with people that handle fraud, with call center uh, folks and customer service folks, with public relations teams. In other words, we come in and we sort of manage, uh, either we manage the whole thing or we manage the response in uh, collaboration, obviously, with the client. And from a legal perspective, we're making the case that, look, it, it, uh, the law touches so many aspects of a response that having a tech-savvy law firm uh, manage, help manage that response is a good way to go. Obviously, that's a shameless plug, but I believe that that is is true. That 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 if you because because um, the law touches so many aspects of it. For example, the forensics team is gathering information about how the breach happened. They should also be gathering information, and the good ones will gathering information that is going to be useful during e-discovery when that inevitable lawsuit comes, okay? So you want to make sure you're capturing that information at the same time that you're doing the analysis so that you can produce it later, okay? And you don't have to incur double the cost. Um, that's one example, but there, there are many, many. Um, you should have a application-sensitive data criticality list, just like the HIPAA requirements require you to have an application criticality list which means in the case of some disaster, which applications are you going to restore first? You ought to have a list that says, hey, these applications have encryptions, these that has encryption, it's of this kind, these don't, because that's really, really going to help as a starting point to do the analysis. Otherwise, you're starting from scratch trying to figure out who owns what applications and so on and so forth, right? This is like, this is data governance 101, but it's rarely done correctly, even though, you know, either for breach response or for e-discovery, people have consultants and lawyers have been preaching to the choir as to the importance of having this sort of thing in place. Um, but rarely is it done right, right? So this is like 101, get your application criticality list in place. Uh, and then have a methodology for determining when a breach has occurred, okay? In the HIPAA space, most people don't know, or they should know by now, right, and our subscribers have it as part of a breach notification framework. There's this three-step analytical framework that walks you through whether or not a breach has occurred, right? And first of all is, was the privacy rule violated? If the privacy rule wasn't violated, then there's no breach by definition, right? And in part of that First question is also, was it unsecured PHI? If it was encrypted PHI, according to the NIST protocols and the recommendation of HHS secretary, then there's no breach by definition. Those same best practices apply if you're talking about payment data, if you're talking about, um, you know, PII, which the FTC would govern. You're going to want to ask the same sorts of questions, right? Was there a privacy breach? And what was breached? What data was compromised? That's a fairly good best practice across the board for almost any kind of breach you can think of. Okay, and obviously the same sort of thing was the data encrypted. If the data was encrypted, you know, the ransomware guys can still encrypt the encryption, okay? And it may be still a violation of the security rule because your data is not available, but it's not a breach not a breach by definition. It wouldn't be a breach of PCI DSS. It wouldn't be a breach of PII uh, as well, right? So these general principles apply uh, across the board. So a methodology is important. You have to have a, a, a way that you can repetitively analyze breach, a breach to see if breach notification is triggered. And then some legal analytical framework, we're talking about, that's what we're talking about here, okay? And, and then that framework should include, right, who do you notify? You got the state, federal, local, perhaps, uh, depending on state law, um, 
agencies that you have to notify. And if you're operating across states and you had more than one state involved in the breach, then you got more than one state that you may have to notify. And almost all the states, in fact, I think 48 out of 50 have their own breach laws now. And they all vary. They're all more stringent than HIPAA. They all, so therefore HIPAA doesn't preempt them. You've got to comply with HIPAA and the state laws. And the state laws tend to be more general. They, they're, they're, they, should, they tend to speak uh, often in terms of sensitive data. They don't say that this is our breach law for HIPAA. They say this is our breach law for these kinds of data. Okay, and right, so whether it's PII, payment data, HIPAA data, and, and so on, right? And so your legal team is going to have to be aware of and deal with those, those um, agencies. Um, and here's the biggest task, really. Here's where the money, I think, can be uh, either really spent badly uh, or saved, disrupted, because if you can coordinate and streamline the communications and the tasks between the teams, by already having a vetted plan in place, then you can reduce the cost of the breach response significantly. Okay, that's our argument. You can reduce the cost of breach response significantly. Now, if anybody uh, has been looking into this space for a while, you know the Ponemon Institute's cost per record in the healthcare space has gone from like 200 five years ago to like I think over 400 recently. Okay, and that math is crazy math because at 200, a breach of 5,000 records, which is a really, really a small breach, that would be a million dollars, okay? That's, that's just now they try to capture a lot of things in that, right? But that would be, that's a really, really small breach, right? That would be, it, 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 at $200, it would be a million, 5,000 records, right? At 400, it's going to be twice that. And you, you got to figure, well, what is it that, they, that, that they've included in that? Now, they try to include a number of things, but I don't think they include payments or civil monetary penalties that you're going to have to play HHS. I don't believe they can really capture the cost of a class action lawsuit, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Uh, now, those numbers, to be honest with you, I'm somewhat suspect of because they're going out of business numbers. That, you know, if you think about that 5,000 is really a small breach where if you got millions of records, you got Equifax, you know, uh, and say that that was a healthcare company. You got 143 million records. You're talking about you're going out of business just on uh, notification, right? So the, those numbers uh, from the Panama Institute, I think, are always, to me, a little suspect. But I can tell you there's going to be a lot of interest in reducing the cost of a response because organizations are going to be responding over and over again because we're in this breach sort of world, right? We're on this, we're in this 24-7, 365 online universe. We got foreign actors that we know are invading, are invading our space. We may have Americans for all we know invading, invading, you know, uh, European spaces and things like that because it's harder, harder to get caught if you're not in country. So what you want to have is not only a plan, but some tools and templates that help you manage the response, right? And that's what our breach response framework aims to do, kind of like our breach notification framework. It's an analytical framework for a response. So I'm going to catch a breath here, Martin, and see if there's any questions. We don't have any at this time, except we forgot to put the slides in to give out, so we'll have to make arrangements for that later. Yes, because uh, I don't know that you can do it now. I, I uh, can't do it once it's started, so we'll, we'll make arrangements. We'll, we'll, send, well, yeah, we'll send them out to everybody once, once we're done. Um, so when you're thinking about a response, you, you, you really are thinking about the, 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 all three legs of the stool. Any breach notification is going to touch the privacy rule. It's obviously going to touch the security rule. This is in the healthcare space. but. It's always going to touch, even if this was PII or payment data, it's always going to touch privacy and security, right? Breach notification, those two things go hand in hand. And you really can't forget about the importance of privacy because the privacy is, is the imperative. Privacy is what we're trying to protect. You know, we can get all caught up in, in, in the necessary cybersecurity controls that you've got to have in place and the 
the technology associated with that, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we can't lose sight of the forest uh, that, that it's privacy that we're trying to protect. And so the, the analysis really starts, that's why the HIPAA analysis starts with, was there a violation of the privacy rule, right? And one question you ought to ask yourself is, well, okay, that seems like a simple enough question to ask, but how do you actually go about determining whether or not there was a violation to the privacy rule, okay? Now, we cover that in our breach notification framework because we go through an analytical framework, sort of a framework within a framework of, well, how do you answer that question, whether or not the privacy rule was violated? Well, you start with the general rule, I think it's 164.502, if my memory serves me correctly, and that general rule references a bunch of specific rules, and you can start eliminating possibilities. Right, if it was, if, if the data was, um, you know, if, if the data was shown or used by the patient, well, that's not a breach. The patient can use it. If it was used by another covered entity, if it was used with um, the proper uh, authorization, and you walk down that general rule through the specific rules, and you're checking things off. Obviously, if you find some use that doesn't comply, then you know you got. They, you know you have a potential breach, right? You, now you got to continue down the analytical framework and, and do the, the rest of the steps, right? And in the HIPAA space, this is, you know, was there a breach of the privacy rule and was a PHI unsecured? And the second step is, was are there any no, are there any exceptions? Now, in the HIPAA, the definition of breach has three exceptions built in. Okay, if your fact pattern fits one of those exceptions, it's not a breach by definition, by law. Okay, and then if it doesn't fit one of those exceptions, then you come down to, well, was there a low probability that the PHI in question was compromised and the burden then is on the covered entity or the business associate because HHS presumes that a breach happened. That's a high burden, okay? Very few, very few instances where you're gonna to get to that third step and say, no, you know, all this stuff happened, yeah, we, it went out the door, and we know it went out the door to this third party, it wasn't a covered entity, it wasn't a business associate, no exceptions apply, but we're going to argue, you know, that low probability. I, I, I can guarantee you that most counsel are not going to counsel their clients to make that argument, because it's, uh, you know, you better have an a airtight case at that point if you're going to argue, argue uh, low probability that the data and questions compromised. Now that framework, this kind of framework, you know, would uh, fit a, you know, personally, personally identifiable information, say the information that, that uh, patients may give you on the website that's not directly related to their health care, right, or payment data, okay? This sort of privacy thing is you can't forget. That's what we're trying to protect. So that general sort of framework is are there, was, was the privacy uh, regime regulated under this thing that's being governed, okay? Say it's PCI DSS, that's governed by contract through Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and so on. And But they're trying to protect privacy as well, right? You have to ask that privacy question. And then, obviously, if, if you have encryption, then there shouldn't be any by definition. It, you know, are there any exceptions? Do they allow? Now, they may not be formal, but do they allow any exceptions, you know what I mean, if we get to this point? So that sort of framework is a good framework, again, across the board. So without a plan, the response is going to be this helter skelter with really the high possibility that the liability attached to the breach is going to increase significantly, right? How you respond matters, right? You, you're, uh, you know, a lot of times it, it uh, the focus tends to be on the public relations effort, but the public relations effort blows up because of a fa failure to plan and a lot of other things that went on behind the scenes. Like, for example, Equifax, I mean, you know, who in their right mind would would allow the executives to start, start uh, selling their shares knowing that this type of breach had occurred? I mean, you're begging for a... Lawsuit, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's criminal insider trading stuff, right? That's 101. You should be saying, hey, you know, if you're a publicly traded company, you can't start selling shares when, when you, and, and, and obviously Equifax, as we learn more, 
apparently they knew about the breach months before they reported it, which is also a big no-no, right? So uh, a well-defined plan executed by knowledgeable teams, that really represents what we believe to be the most effective way to limit both the liability and the response costs. And, again, that's going to mean that you have a plan in place and teams that have talked before. Right? You've already coordinated. You already kind of know what you're going to do. And really, it's not unlike responding to a hurricane and the coordination between national, state, local. I mean, if you heard, um, I can't remember his last name. I know his first name is Brock. He's the director of FEMA now. He's excellent as far as coordination, planning. Uh, he, he was masterful. Okay, but you can you could see that this immense amount of work had gone into preparation long before Irma ever hit the west coast of Florida. Okay, obviously if you wait uh, until the disaster is upon you, the response is also going to be disastrous. Okay, and even then, when you've done this planning and coordination, you know it, it, it's a tough, complex issue to handle. So. Let's talk about incidents for a second. We said it's an attempted or successful unauthorized access, use, disclosure, uh, et cetera, of, a, of an electronic system, but it could be a, still a paper-based system. And, and, and if we just um, know that uh, from healthcare, there's still a lot of paper records. There probably will be for our lifetime. There's probably uh, a lot, a, a lot, maybe less so now, but, uh, you know, there used to be a lot of more paper-based uh, payment information that vendors uh, would keep. Uh, I, I think that that um, is going away slowly. Uh, so it all starts with incidents. We're going to talk more about incidents uh, in a little bit here. But here's uh, an overview of the team of teams. Okay, you got the executive management team, and you would think that they would be the ones that are going to be involved and really rolling this thing out and getting it done. And, you know, we all know that that's really not the case. Okay? Even take something like Irma, right? If the governor and the president are involved at some high level. They're not involved in day-to-day, -day, you know, working with FEMA and getting this thing. they got their teams and their people that hopefully, they hope, have coordinated well enough to get this job done in a way that doesn't reflect badly on them. But, you know, why they need to be a prize, why they need to be, uh, why they can be the face of the response, like in Florida, uh, our governor was, you know, did a good job of being the face of the response. He, he was able to do that effectively because he had lots of teams that were coordinating um, underneath him, okay? And so, uh, yes, we need to update the, uh, the executive team. We need to tell them sort of, you know, the lay of the land, you know, well, what are we looking at here, et cetera, et cetera. But the key is not going to be the executive management team in, in getting this thing done. The key is likely to be what sort of partnerships have you put in place with these other teams, uh, and hopefully those teams have already spoken to each other before this response had to happen. That's really the key, okay? And one of them being the legal team, all right? So, you know, part of breach notification may look like a technical task, and it, and it is on its face, you know, but underneath, it, 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 all of it has this legal implication uh, related, especially, you know, starting with whether breach notification was triggered in the first place, okay? That starts with a legal analysis, and so the, the legal team needs to be involved working with, uh, you know, inside counsel, uh, maybe outside counsel uh, as well, just depends you know, making sure that, yes, okay, we know enough facts to, to verify that breach notification is triggered. Now our response plan has to kick into action. Well, what other players do you have? Well, obviously you have the compliance team, okay? Now, a compliance officer within lots of organizations really wears a lot of hats, often way too many, and their um, – Mandate is compliance, okay? Their mandate is not response. They're not lawyers. They're not forensic data experts generally. Uh, they're certainly not PR people, right? They're going to play a role 
in the response, but they're uh, probably not the right team to lead it. Okay, and so you know, but as you can see, you have all these teams. What about the forensics team? Well, you know, well, well you know, some of you may be asking, right? And uh, uh, ten years ago, I would have asked too. And I, now, I, I, I was in tech before I started practicing law. You know, breaches weren't a common thing back then, right? You know, in the dot-com boom of 2000 and what followed, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, you know, a good question would be, what was what the forensics team? I mean, what do they do, right? Well, these guys are the ones that do the deep dive into networks and the protocols. You know, they're aware of the threat vectors. They're the ones that, you know, you on television you usually see work for the CIA or the FBI. It's a specialty, okay? It's a specialty. Now, cybersecurity itself has now become an academic discipline, right? And a lot of cybersecurity graduates would probably be part of forensics teams. But it's not, it's not computer science. It's not information technology. It's a totally it, – it borrows from those disciplines, but it's different from them, okay? And forensics is just like you're investigating the scene of a crime. Right, and you have to, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to disrupt the crime scene. You want to gather the evidence in, in, in an appropriate way, an appropriate way later for either some sort of criminal prosecution if you're the FBI, or some civil lawsuit, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not your IT team, but your IT team also, as we'll see, is going to have a role, right? So you can begin to see that if you haven't coordinated uh, or or even thought about what a response plan look, looks like, you're now scrambling, whoever you are that's been given the charge. Okay, you're the general man. You're not scrambling to figure all this stuff out, right? So other teams, information technology, public relations, you know, identity protection. Maybe you have uh, a contract in place with somebody like Experience. Customer service, I mean, who's going to be answering the 800 number? Right? What kind of information are you going to be sharing with the public, and and in what way? Okay, and this is really, really, you know, highly critical stuff because that's who the public is going to be interacting with. Okay, and you don't want to have um, a, a a a breach, and and you have this 800 call service, and you know, for whatever reason, the folks on the other line don't speak fluent English or speak English in, in a way, accented way, that people can't understand, okay? That, I mean, that, that, that's not good anyway for customer service, right? And I mean, I'm not being just the ugly American. We've all been frustrated on, you know, on calls where we just can't, you know, we, people can't really help us because we, we can't understand them, right? So you're gonna, you know that that's not what you want. You want perfectly understandable English on the other end end of that line when somebody's, you know, calling about, hey, what am I going to do? How do I protect myself from further fraud? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you need? You need some sort of compliance framework, response framework, right? And, and this framework should function within a set of processes that drive its execution, okay? And that's the, that's the thing about having a framework is you've, you've thought about how you're going to respond you understand who the teams are. Hopefully you have relationships with, with these teams already. And then you can start executing a plan, and not a plan that you've made up on the fly, an existing plan that you've modified for this set of facts. Okay, but, again, you're not, you're not starting uh, for scratch, from scratch. Like for small organizations, Right, you, you know, uh, we we recommend implementing incident tracking as part of the, the framework that we give you, just because you probably don't have anything else in place. And having a at least at a minimum a spreadsheet that captures incidents and w which applications were affected on what date and so forth, you know, and and then you use our breach um, um, documentation, our breach document to do the analysis. At least that gives you a place to start. Larger organizations likely have reporting systems. They have, you know, um, they already have, like, help desk systems. Now, it's curious, and I'd like to know, we can just throw that question out there, 
and how many how many organizations uh, in our audience use their their help desk system as a place to report incidents, uh, breach incidents? And the reason I ask that is I've gone into a lot of healthcare organizations and just asked this basic question: If you had a breach, do you know who to call? You know, and you get that deer in the headlights look. Do you, do you know who your privacy officer and security officer is? You know, and these are these are one oh one oh one things, right? I mean these are things that if you're tra if you're training, if you're a compliance officer and you're not training your people to answer those questions, right, appropriately so that they know, you know, would they even recognize a breach if they saw one? Right? I mean uh, it, but how do you report it on that? I mean you gotta have those systems in place. These are the things that uh if you have when you have a breach, these are the things that when HHS comes in, if it was in the healthcare space, you're gonna perhaps get whacked for willful neglect, which the fines start at $50,000 per violation, because you didn't have these 101 practices in place, or you thought you had them in place. Now, sometimes I walk into large organizations that are doing a fairly good job on things like two-factor authentication and all that. They got that locked down, but they still can't answer that basic question, right? So, Martin, are we getting any show of hands for organizations that use their help that ticketing system to actually do their, like, cybersecurity breach incident gathering and capturing? Uh, you didn't ask for a show of hands. I'm waiting for it to come in now that you've asked for it. So uh, I'm just doing one. Looks like one. To me. Okay, one out of 77. Um, and, you know, uh, that's a small percentage, right? And now another show of hands. So. Out three, of that, actually. I, three actually. Three actually. Three okay. actually. Yeah, I got it. Three actually. That's still a small percentage. So out of the 77, how many are using some other reporting, some other group uh, that where you report uh, incidents to? Like the I, maybe it's the IT group, apart from the customer help uh, desk. So show hands on, on that. Okay, so uh, Martin, you can just report back when, when we get five, to here. Six, five, six, 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 right? And that that would be about my guess. Is that still that's a larger percentage? Uh, but you know, not ten percent. Exactly. You're right. This is like one hundred and one. You're you're going to get whacked with a willful neglect violation, right? If you don't have some sort of incident reporting uh, in place, right? And I I would say that if you have a help desk. That's a natural way to do it. Not that they're going to analyze the incident, but they can log it, okay? And they can they can they can do the initial. Wait a minute, what, what kind of incident was this? You know, and they should learn to ask the right questions. Oh, it's, it, well, it's this kind of application, and they should have an application criticality list and says, oh, oh, this application, this application, this is our ER, this is our ERM, this is our electric uh, records or uh, electric healthcare records management system. Right, that's got PHI. I need to notify, you know, the HIPAA compliance officer, right? I mean, because they're already in the business of accepting tickets and, you know, and doing that sort of thing. Otherwise, you're going to have some redundancies and that you're going to have to, you should implement a similar system somewhere else, right? So you already have a system in place if you have a help desk. Why don't you just extend that uh, and train those folks to do the initial capture? Yes, they're going to be handing it off, but at least... They can log the initial incident. They got systems already to do that. They can they can say who it was handed off to. They can document that, uh, etc. Right. So this, these are I'm going to just walk through some of this managing incidents 101. So incident gathering. Well, who's responsible? I mean, who is trained? How do you know? Everybody should be trained on what an incident might look like and who to call. Right. I mean, otherwise, what do you think? It's just your IT people. No. Every everybody, because everybody, for example, has been targeted for phishing. Right? You take one take our phishing training, everybody in the organization should take our phishing training. Right? Because they should because phishing that's an incident. If you got targeted with a phishing scheme, right? Maybe many in your organization got targeted, maybe it was just you because you're the CFO and they know something about you, right? You should know 
not only how to recognize the fact that you are being fished, but what do you do about it? It doesn't stop there. You've got to know something's got to trigger that this is an incident. It's a reportable incident, and, oh, in my organization, yeah, I remember my training, well, I have to get a hold of the compliance officer, right? And then, you, you know, they, they do the appropriate handoff, or I call, you know, we call the help desk and log an incident, and they get a hold of the compliance officer, right? Then you've got to know within your organization who's responsible for doing that initial incident analysis, right? Because if, for example, if uh, it's a type of uh, – it's an application from your application criticality list that contains PHI, but you, you, you've uh, documented the fact that this, uh, the data at rest and data in transit or data in motion have all been encrypted according to NIST protocols, blah, 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 you know, that sort of ends the incident. It's not an incident by definition, but who, who's responsible? And somebody should be documenting the fact that, yes, we looked at it, we determined that it was this particular system. That system is protected with these protocols that meet X, Y, Z regulatory regime requirements, and therefore breach notification is not triggered. Somebody signs off on that, and that's the, the the analysis that was done. Obviously, if you get the you know if it wasn't encrypted, then you got to go down this breach notification framework, and probably at this point you're getting counsel involved. Right? So you ought to know at what point does counsel have to get involved. So there's this entire process of responding, but it starts with how do you manage incidents within your organization, right? How do you do that initial stuff before you can ever get to a response, right? And, again, we're, we're, we're sort of going backwards if we started talking about response, but you almost have to talk about incidents when you open up this can of worms because that's an incident is what leads to an eventual response. And you can imagine, you, you know, in, in, lot, in organizations large and small that if you're not trained and you're not taught to think along these lines, you know, who knows who you hand it off to and where it goes and how long it takes to analyze. And maybe you, you know, you're like Equifax that, the time it took to work through your organization was months in the making because that's how your organization works and you're, you've never been trained to think along these lines. So, you know, we're living in the 21st century continually pushing the edge on what we do with technology, but our processes with respect to the bad things that technology can do are lagging. There's still 20th century responses, right? And we've got this gap that we, gotta, that, that we have to close, and it's a significant gap. It's a significant gap. You can tell by the response that we had today here that a lot of people just aren't doing this correctly, don't even have the basis in place that would uh, allow them to uh, uh, allow their counsel to make a good faith argument that they're not in willful neglect. Look, yes, we may have messed up a little bit. We had a response plan. We knew our teams were. We started executing. Then you can make a good faith effort, right, a good faith argument that, that uh, hey, you know, we did the best we could, right? We, we made a good faith effort. We had a plan. We, we had tested the plan, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't know who to report an incident to and all that, then, you're, you know, you're going you're gonna to get that willful violation, $50,000 fine, and there's probably lots of other things you're not doing that are 101. And each one of those could be willful neglect in a $50,000 fine. So what people don't understand in the HIPAA space is that $1.5 million in fines that you see is not – it is not a maximum. That is a maximum per identical violation. So if you had 20 other violations that all maxed out, well, then you're going to have a $30 million plus civil monetary penalty, okay? And, I, you know, when there's a breach, HHS is going to come knocking in, in, in the HIPAA space. They're going to come knocking. They're going to find a bunch of stuff, okay? And that's where those fines really, really add up. Yes, you got all the breach notification costs. Now you got these civil monetary penalties that you may have to pay or just a settlement with HHS because you agreed to do a corrective action plan, right? So this is, you know, managed incidents is really blocking and tackling. And in order to get this process, you really need to change the organizational DNA because, like I said, we're using 21st century technology that's evolving really fast, and we got 20th century processes in our DNA, we're not ready. 
Okay, we're not ready. We're not ready for Hurricane Irma. We're not even close to being ready for a Cat 1, let alone a Cat 4 or Cat 5. Okay, and it's going to take policy, process, and if I had uh, the wherewithal to change that third dice, I would say platform. But those are the three Ps, policy, process, and platform, or platform being, you know, technology. Uh, but it, it, it's really kind of part of the compliance, what we call the compliance equation, because if you have policies in place for a regulatory requirement and you have uh, processes that underpin the policy, okay, and then you have tracking mechanisms in place for that requirement, then you have visible demonstrable evidence of, of compliance for that requirement. So if you have a training policy, I'm, I'm your auditor, and I say, Mr. Smith, well, show me your training policy, and you show me the policy, and it says that we train our employees once a year, and, you know, when they're new, we train them within 30 days, and so on and so forth. And then I say, okay, well, talk to me about your processes, you know, and so is it is it is it video based? Is it classroom based? Is, is there a test? What's the passing score? Show me some of the some show me some of the test results. I want to see I want to see evidence of your processes that underpin your policy. Otherwise, policies are just flowery language. It's what an organization intends to do. We intend to do this. We intend to do. It's all motherhood and apple pie. Okay. And finally, I want to ask a sixty-four million dollar question. Okay. Well, show me your tracking database. Show me that spreadsheet or that HR system where you can show me where Dr. John, that's got trained, or Nurse Sue, or the ad, and show me that. I want to see, I want to see results of your training. And if you can't show me all three, then you don't have visible demonstrable evidence that you're meeting the training requirement. Okay? So these are the kinds of things that HHS is going to find when they come and do the investigation after the inevitable breach, right? And this is where the money really, really mounts up. So not only do you have, if you don't plan effectively, is the breach response going to be helter skelter? You may run into these sort of crazy uh, results, like not informing executives, don't start selling your stock because of blah, 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 so on and so forth, right? And uh, that itself probably could run into the millions of dollars. Then you're going to have these fines. Uh, on top of that. So, Martin, I'm going to take another breath here and see if there's a, a question. Well, there are no questions, but it, it would seem to me that uh, besides the fines that are imposed by HIPAA and the FTC and whoever, I think there's probably some uh, insider trading that might, you know, put you in a, in a low security prison for a couple years. Well, in the case, yes, in the case of uh, Equifax, I think that they're, they're, they're already criminal investigations probably underway, right? And, yeah. I, I mean, that's just flat out stupid. You just can't hide a major breach like that and start selling, you know, have, be an insider and start selling the shares. That, yeah, that's going to that's gonna get you into federal prison, you know. But, I mean, that's, uh, I, I, hopefully that's an outlier, but that's the kind of thing that counsel – one of the reasons we make that argument that, that a tech-savvy law firm should be uh, your general manager or working with your general manager of your response team because the law touches so many uh, aspects of the response that are not obvious on its face, okay, and that, you know, if, if you don't have, uh, you know, if, if you sort of put legal in a box, then legal doesn't have the appropriate vision into the complete response to uh, offer the right advice almost every step along the way. Okay, so, um, but here's a methodology, okay, that came out of our breach notification framework that we are proposing really is methodology that could be used across the board for PCI DSS payment data, for personal identifiable information for PHI, et cetera, and it, it starts with what we've been talking about. Was there an impermissible use or disclosure of unsecured or con sensitive data. Okay, in the HIPAA space, it would be impermissible user disclosure really translates into a violation of the privacy rule. Okay, uh, and then you ask the encryption question, right? If you encrypt it according to the secretary's um, you know, recommendations using this protocol, you could be good to go. Are, are there any exceptions that might apply? And, you know, you're going to have to ask this question at the federal level. Uh, 
at the state level, maybe even at the local level. Okay, um, and I haven't seen any local sort of county breach laws, but that's not saying that 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 they don't exist. Okay, and then you know what was the probability that the SD in question sensitive data was actually compromised? Right, this 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 general framework is a pretty good framework across the board, right? Because when you're talking a uh, any kind of large organization, you, you're you're uh, you're compliance with a, you're, you're complying with a lot of regimes. You're complying with PCI DSS. You should be or should be. You're compliant, trying to comply with PCI DSS, trying to comply with HIPAA, trying to comply with Sarbanes Oxley. I mean, you know, it, it, it's inordinately complex, right? You got to have a, a, a methodology that hopefully would work uh, as a general purpose methodology that you could adopt and use. Okay, and so we borrowed this from our. Um, breach notification framework to extend it to just sensitive data, saying it all starts with an incident, right? It all starts with that incident 101. How did the incident get logged, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you log the incident, and then you ask the question, was this a sensitive data system? No. Well, it might other, you know, it, it, other laws might apply, you know, but if it's not, create an incident document, you know, uh, annotate the fact that it's not a sensitive data system, breach analysis is closed, you're good to go, right? Was the SD secured? Now, it turns out that that question is really, you know, in the HIPAA space, a lot more complex, just like everything else about cybersecurity. There's a lot hiding underneath uh, that until you start peeling back the onion, you're not aware of because really, SD at rest, you're saying was the, was the sensitive data secured? You got to ask, well, was it at rest? And then what protocol does the regulatory regime require? Was it in motion? you know, what regulatory, what, what does a regulatory regime require, right? And so at rest, NIST says you ought to be using such and such protocol if you want to be, if you want to take advantage of the breach notification safe harbor. If, it's, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the PHI was in motion, then you should be using probably now TLS 2.0, okay? Maybe was the SD being disposed of? For example, hopefully by now everybody's heard of the cases where you have people getting rid of copiers, and they didn't realize that the copiers took an image of everything that you copied on. And if you're a, a, a hospital or an ambulatory practice or any other kind of clinical practice, you know that you got tons of PHI on that uh, copier. Now you may want to do a good thing, give it to uh, hospice because you don't you've gotten a brand new copier and you don't use it, and just have a bunch of PHI just walk out the door because you didn't dispose of it, you didn't clean it correctly. All right, and you know, NIST has a set of protocols and a set of best practices for how you actually get rid of sensitive data PHI in a way that you can say, yes, we wiped it clean. All right, and you actually have to have people signing off saying this device was wiped clean. I guarantee you, most organizations don't have these processes in place, and really, these are like cybersecurity 101. Right? This is why you're going to get willful neglect fines because even the basics are not in place. And then, of course, you're talking about really don't forget, don't lose track of the forest, which is privacy. Was the privacy violated? Privacy is what drives everything, right? And if we were in the EU, we would all be, you know, students of GDPR, or whatever they're calling their new privacy law. And it's clear the way the Europeans talk about it that privacy is the imperative. Right? Yes, you've got to do this forensic stuff and, you know, and the rest of it, but, uh, but privacy is, is the imperative. So, again, right, this set of flow charts is what we have in our breach notification framework that we're going to have a similar set in our breach response to help you think through how do you actually do this analysis, right? Here's the analysis was, you know, was it disclosed to a consumer? Or was there a valid authorization? Did you disclose it to a representative that had legal authority? We borrowed from the analysis of the privacy rule that said, you know what, this could be a general purpose framework for analyzing, uh, piece, you know, payment data, PII, et cetera. Okay. You know, here, were there any identifiers that removed? So it was the identifier, it's no longer PHI uh, in the HIPAA space, et cetera, right? So you're going to have some sort of analytical framework that you go through before notification required. Who goes through the framework? How do you document? Where do you get the incident from? 
All those things are basic questions that your organization should have answers to if HHS, uh, when HHS or a court of law uh, comes calling. Now, one, one thing that, uh, that you ought to be aware of is negligence suits based on HIPAA are on the rise. So everybody should know that an individual patient, all they can do is complain. They can't bring a lawsuit for a violation of, 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 of their privacy rights. Okay? They can complain. They can file a complaint with HHS or they can file a complaint with their state attorney general, and that state attorney general or HHS could bring an action. Okay? But what a patient can't do, what a patient can't do or a class of patients is bring a class action negligence suit, that you were negligent in, for example, releasing the fact that I'm HIV positive. Right, as Aetna just did because they had envelopes with that little window and that little window was inappropriately placed where they were showing information regarding patients' HIV status. Okay, well, but you, you can rest assured that there's going to be a class action lawsuit because of that. And a lot of states are starting to adopt HIPAA as the standard for the standard of care. In other words, right here are the four elements that you've got to meet to, to prevail, a plaintiff has to meet on, to prevail on the negligence to duty. Was there a duty to protect my information? Okay, was there a breach of that duty? Okay, was that, did that breach of the duty, was it the legal and proximate cause of my harm that I'm complaining about and were there damages? Okay, and those are the four elements and now, that the fact that you violated HIPAA, that HIPAA is the standard of care that's used to measure whether you accurately or adequately protected my privacy, all right? And so if you breach HIPAA, then those first two elements are established, right? You had a duty under the law. HIPAA is the duty under the law to protect my privacy of my healthcare records. You breach that duty. Now I, I, I just need to show the fact that that caused the harm, and that harm caused me some sort of generally uh, economic damages or emotional distress or something like that that eventually will translate into money. Okay, Martin, any questions at this point? No, I think they're all mesmerized with, with the uh, statements. <laughs> Well, I hope uh, that uh, you're getting some information that uh, that you don't get elsewhere, some news you can use. There are, here are some definitions that will be helpful to you if you're thinking about a general purpose sort of response framework. Uh, we're calling it sensitive data, right? Any confidential personal data protected by applicable law where breach would be triggered, um, would trigger a response under that law. Uh, and as a general rule, it potentially compromises linked to an individual, et cetera. What is not sensitive data? Well, here, uh, for our breach response, we elected to treat IP, intellectual property, not as sensitive data. The reason why is, is, is that uh, IP, in, internally to your organization, more and more your intellectual property is the crown jewels, right? That's everything. That's what we do. That's how we, uh, that's how we monetize our knowledge and, what, you know, Google is a completely IP-driven company, Microsoft. And more and more, almost every, you know, car companies are turning in, into computers. Almost every company you can think of that's doing anything of interest in the digital economy is being driven by their IP. But if your IP gets stolen generally, unless it's a foreign actor, there's no laws that says you got to report, you know, there's a breach. Uh, you know, in fact, there's no, you know, you don't want to report it, right? You don't you sort of, but your IP has now been stolen. So internally, you want to treat IP as kind of sensitive data. The only reason that we're making a distinction here is because it's not likely to trigger any applicable law unless it was a foreign actor, and then you're going to maybe uh, want to report that to the FBI, and there may be some laws that says that you have to uh, report that to the, uh, to, to the FBI, to other authorities. So you're going to want to have a definition for what is unsecured sensitive data. Uh, and whether, you know, what, what, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean as per the regulatory regime that governs this kind of data, right? So it's not, in, at, at the end of the day, you aren't gonna have, you're going to have to get down to that, those applicable law or laws 
right? And one or more regulatory machines that may have been activated because of this breach. Um, again, communications is really going to be the heart of the response. Internal communications to get the right information, to do the right thing with respect to remediation, to do the right thing with respect to the customer. Uh, and, and then, you know, when you start touching the customer, you know, you're going to do it via media and social media. How is that going to work? Who's going to drive it? You know, how much information do you reveal? You know, all that has legal consequences. So that we get back to, you know, the tech-savvy law firm ought to be somehow involved in this process. You know, what about the call center? Who's going to do that? Your identity protection, et cetera, et cetera, right? Communications uh, is, is you know, the thing that uh, can cause disruption with respect to uh, a, a response cost costing tens of millions of dollars, okay, or more, just the response, not the penalties and the rest of it, just the response, or, you know, a million dollars or less, right, and depending on how it was handled, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, our, uh, what we're uh, putting forth is communications is everything. Communications uh, is expensive. It's expensive to communicate correctly. Right? I mean, I'm in the communications business when I practice law all the time. I'm either communicating with the court, I'm communicating with a client, I'm communicating with a new client. You know, it, communications is paramount. Communications is everything. It's expensive. It's expensive. One of the reasons that lawyers get in the most trouble is they don't communicate effectively enough with their, uh, with their clients. And then their clients report them to the bar. That is the number one, you know, complaint against lawyers. You gave, you gave a lawyer a bunch of money. And then two months later, you're still, they're not returning your emails, they don't return your phone calls, et cetera, et cetera, right? Communications, and one of the reasons is, you know, sure, we all get busy. And, and the, other, the other reason is it's expensive. It's expensive from a time perspective. You have to stop and communicate. And, uh, you know, in any knowledge-driven work, you know uh, that communications is really uh, where a, a large part of the cost goes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you here because we, we've got a bevy of questions. Okay. A bevy. A oh, bevy. A bevy. Very good. More than, more than one, let's put it that way. Shoot me with the first bevy. Is it a breach if an employee emails PHI from their work email account to their personal email account? Well, you know, again, how would you let me let me let me just see if people have been paying attention, the audience has been paying attention. What what would be the first question you would ask uh, if you were going to an, analyze that this incident? Let, this is let's treat this as an incident, okay? Somebody why why did you need to do it? Well, yes, but you know that. That's sort of a collateral sort of question. The first thing is, was the patient's privacy violated? Well, in the HIPAA space, the security rule doesn't the, the, the security rule doesn't mandate that you encrypt um, that you encrypt PHI in motion. Okay, it says that if you encrypt it, you can take advantage of the breach notification safe harbor. So this causes a lot of confusion because a lot of people think just the simple emailing of PHI is a breach in and of itself. It's not. Now, if somebody with a sniffer got in the middle and sniffed it out because it wasn't encrypted, then yes. So it's going to depend on the facts, right? That's going to, you know, the typical legal answer depends. It depends on the facts and this, that, and the other. But just emailing it from your work to your home, uh, although that may not be a best practice, and yes, you want to, you're going to want to ask the question, why did you do it? Just like, like if you have a policy of not storing any PHI on any local device, because the device gets stolen and you, you find somebody did that and it's against your policy, well, then you might want to sanction them. But the first question that you asked in that analytical framework was, was the privacy rule violated? And what, the answer here is no. There's no. We don't have, we don't have any facts that say just because you emailed it to your home that any, any – and you're entitled to look at it at work because there's this sort of – blending of work and home that goes on now, right? We, we, 
I mean, everybody works weekends in some sort of way. You try to catch up with your email, respond to email, respond to this boss's presentation that you couldn't work on because your kid got sick during the week. And I mean, this goes on and on all the time. Now, you may have a policy that says don't do that, and that might be sanctionable under your policy, but it's not a, in this case, if the, if the patient's privacy was not compromised, then it wasn't a breach. Okay. Uh, here's a question. If the office has a breach and the office has a legal issue from it, does it include the staff if the staff had nothing to do with the breach? I, I'm, 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 I'm assuming that the question is, is, uh, is the staff liable, right? And the answer would be generally no, especially if the, it was staff that had nothing to do with the breach, okay? Generally, the time, the only time that a staff, the staff is going to be personally liable is when they commit a wrongful act, like, you know, they knew, they know Bruce Springsteen just got admitted and they go snooping. They're, they're not one of the clinicians or doctors that are responsible for treating the boss, but they go snooping through their EHR trying to figure out what he's in for. That's a wrongful violation that will get you fired, might get you sued personally, and so on, right? Then the staff, then the staff could be liable. But short of a wrongful act like that, no, the staff is generally not going to be liable. Now, you know, there may be some liability, not criminal, we're not talking criminal liability, civil liability, if you as a compliance officer, you know, didn't have the proper training or knew of breaches and didn't report it. I mean, that may, that may lead to, you know, uh, higher civil monetary penalties uh, imposed uh, upon you and you, you, you have some sort of career liability. Uh, that way, but if you're, you know, unless you did an intentionally wrongful act, uh, you're not, you're not going to have kind of criminal liability. Okay, um, I think this is part of the first question about uh, sending the email to yourself, and would an attestation of destruction suffice as a remediation, even though it's hard, if not impossible, to prove emails? Are ever completely deleted. Well, I mean, if you're sending it to yourself, again, the question is, from a breach perspective, was the privacy rule violated? Uh, it just under these hypothetical facts, I, you know, my response is no. If you're allowed to see it at work, this, you know, this line between work and home has been obliterated. So the fact that you had some reason to send yourself this PHI because, you know, let's say you were a doctor. And you were going home, and you needed to contact the patient, and for whatever reason, maybe your system was down, and sending yourself this PHI was the only way you were going to have it when you were expected to talk with the patient. There, there's no breach. You're allowed to look at it at work. Really, you're still at work when you're at home. There's no breach, right? Uh, now, there may be against your policy, and, you know, the doctor might say, yeah, but I had a valid excuse. I had a valid, there was a valid exception. You know what I mean? I had no other way. Our system was down. I couldn't access it from home, and so therefore, you know, blah, 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 right? And so that, that's not a case where destruction and attestation would come in. There, there are some exceptions built into the definition of breach under HIPAA that say if you wrongfully sent it to another covered entity, okay, and, or a business associate who's covered under HIPAA, and that person, you know, could be the admin or whatever who got the facts or whatever, got the email attested to destroying it, then it's not a breach because it met one of the exceptions because sending it to the wrong covered entity, for example, the wrong doctor, faxing or emailing stuff to the wrong covered entity happens all day, every day, 365. And for that reason, HHS carved out three breach exception fact patterns. Okay, and there, there are fact patterns, like lawyers like to talk about fact patterns. If these facts kind of fit this, this, these exceptions, exception one covers a certain set of facts. Exception two, if your facts fall within one of these three exceptions of the definition of breach, then it's not a breach by definition. One of those exceptions is sending it to another covered entity, calling that covered entity, and that covered entity or business associate attest to the fact that they got it, but they destroyed it. That, that otherwise would be a breach, 
but they got it and they destroyed it and they attested that and then you're okay. All right. Now, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this one. This is a real toughie. Do you have any recommendations for basic HIPAA training courses or providers? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we, we, happen to, we happen to do that at Three Lions. We have over 15. As part of our subscription, you get uh, Espresso, which is the risk assessment express that literally lets you do a risk assessment in three hours or less because we pre-populated with over 160 risks. We rationalize all the threat vulnerability, you know, pairs that you need. We consolidated those 400,000 threat vectors into nine threat categories. And so then you have to walk through and assign probabilities of this threat exploiting this, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that's what you get as part of our subscription. You get Espresso, but you also get we have over 15 training modules. So we have a privacy rule training, a security rule training, breach notification training, phishing training. Then we have training for compliance officers, you know, how to pass a HIPAA audit training for the privacy rule, HIPAA audit training for the security rule, and so on. Uh, and we have a certification that you can take over. Yeah, each, each, each module comes with 20 question true false. Some of them, a few of them, the majority come with 20 question true false. A few of them come with 10. And uh, if you, pass, you know, we like, we like, we like to say, if you get, if 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 someone in your organization gets seventy percent or better on the test, they're good. You document that in our training spreadsheet, and you've got visible demonstrable evidence that they were trained, right? So, you know, we we like to think that we got some of the best training, um, you know, in the mar on the market, and you get all of that. You get all our products plus Espresso for the, you know, for the initial subscription price, which is twenty five hundred dollars, and. You also get any new products free as part of that subscription. So this reach response framework that I've been talking about is going to be one of our products that we release as part of our subscription. You won't pay anything else, and we would argue that um, uh, that that product itself is worth the price of entry. I'm not going to read you these definitions here because you can read them when you get the uh, you know when you get the slides. Uh, I'm going to jump to because we're about at this place. So. This is what we do. We have Espresso. We talked a little bit about. Uh, you can get a 15-day a trial free without giving us your credit card or anything else. We'll help you during that 15-day trial, walk you through doing your first risk assessment. But risk assessment without remediation products, like our security rule checklist, our uh, scorecards that cross walk all the requirements, you know, what we're offering in a subscription is a complete system of compliance, not just something that does a risk assessment, but something that does the remediation as well. We also just recently announced as part of our subscription something we're calling Heartbeat, which one of our technical partners will come in and do a scan of your network at no additional cost to you, all right, and give you the results of, you know, are, are your password policies correct? Are you, are your, you know, is your software um, patched correctly, et cetera, et cetera, all right? So, that's part of our subscription as well. It's a one-time sort of thing, and then if you have some remediation that comes out of that, then that's sort of between you and our technical partner. But that's Heartbeat is something that, that we announced. It's completely free to our subscribers and optional. You know, you don't, you don't have to do it. Um, there's compliance as a service, right, that, uh, that our technical partner can help you with. That's really separate. But uh, we have um, – I'm going to get here. We, we have – um, like I said, checklist, training, the notification framework, model business associate contracts, model privacy rule contracts, model I mean, contracts policies, model security rule policies, model uh, cloud policies. So, right, a lot of people would take our, our, our policies are ready to go out of the box. You make some changes, you route it through to your executives, and, you know, voila, you got, you got a set of policies that, that you have, and we, you know, we don't. We have like one security rule policy, not a hundred, right? It's like it's crazy. I'm not bad. I don't bad mouth our competitors by name, but it's like it's crazy to have a hundred template policies that 95% of boilerplate for the security rule, right? Our security rule policy model policy comes right out of our security rule checklist. Now, our security rule checklist is not any old checklist. It covers every single one of the audit requirements in the HHS audit protocol. And for every requirement, it gives you those three things that you got to have for visible demonstrable evidence. It gives you the policy that you should have for this requirement. It gives you the processes, processes that you should implement to underpin the policy. 
and it gives you suggested tracking results. So you can track process results. So you have all three. That's per requirement, right? Same thing with the privacy rule checklist. So, you know, we have a, a system uh, that, that uh, has an underlying methodology, not just a bunch of sort of, you know, one-off products that we throw together into a subscription. So we like to think that we, we provide the recipe and not just the ingredients. And I'm going to stop right here, Martin, if there's any other questions as to that, you know, that hardball question. But if our products and our subscription and our webinars and our newsletters, if you haven't signed up, you need to sign up. Really, we, we do a free monthly newsletter. It's all focused on education and literacy. Okay? you got to get your literacy up. Your, and getting your literacy up is how you get your organizational DNA uh, with respect to compliance up. And compliance um, is going to be a bigger and bigger issue uh, going forward, right? And compliance generally uh, in the past was, wasn't one of these sort of, you know, glamour sort of careers, you know, sort of it was off to the side and compliance was this necessary evil. Compliance for a whole host of reasons that we could probably talk about in, the, in, in a, a webinar by itself is becoming more and more prominent, more and more visible. You need more, uh, a deeper skill set. I think it's going to be rewarded better. Sure, that's not the state of compliance today, but I think that, that that's where it's going because of the nature of the world uh, that we now live in, right? So we like to think we have agile compliance products. You can start executing on day one. They're agnostic, at least our, uh, and the majority of our, our products right now are, are HIPAA focused. They're agnostic as to whether or not you're a, a business associate or a covered entity. And really, there's not that much difference between what business associates have to do and what covered entities have to do now under the High Tech Act. Business associates are statutorily on the hook uh, for the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. There is no business associate light HIPAA that, you know, and yes, there are some things that don't apply, but, you know, the majority of the people, like, for example, our, my law firm offers a jump start. So if you buy three line subscription, I will spend, you know, for an extra $2,500, I will then provide you legal guidance as to how and show you how to walk through our products and then write you an opinion letter if you can show me visible demonstrable evidence. Most of the people that, that, that sort of purchase that program are business associates because they're getting beat up by covered entities now that have gotten wise that, oh, shit, this is a real problem. And our, we know we're not complying and we pretty sure our business associates aren't complying. So they're starting to beat up the business associates and business associates know that if they don't get into the compliance game, they might not get this piece of business that they otherwise would have gotten, right? So it's now becoming this cost of entry, cost of doing business, because government entities have gotten wiser and smarter and asking, asking tougher questions and so forth, right? So, uh, you know, what we, our products are, are agnostic as to whether or not you're a business associate or a covered entity. And, you know, the, our jump, my Jumpstart program from our legal firm is agnostic. And we like to think, we you know, what we're doing is, transferring wetware. Wetware is that information that's in our heads about compliance and transferring that through our product, hopefully into your head so you can get the, your literacy rate up. And Martin, if there are no further questions, then I want to thank the audience uh, for sticking um, around. The, the one thing I was going to point out for the person who asked uh, the question, do we know any places where you can get good training, yeah, you know, what vendors you might suggest, that you can go to www.store.hippasurvivalguide.com and look at all our all, yeah, our, actually, all our stuff there. Sorry to interrupt, Martin, but uh, you don't need the www in front of us. Uh, you want to just go to the store at store.hippasurvivalguide.com, like on this slide right here. Right? Uh -huh. If you want to go... You don't need the WW. In fact, if you do the WW in front of it, it won't, you, you won't go anywhere. You'll get a 404 or whatever. Just store.survivorguide.com. Uh, I know you knew that, but um, yeah, I, don't, I didn't want you to, I didn't want your mistake to confuse the audience. If you want to go to the Hippos Fire Guide website where the, the full text of the High Tech Act and, uh, and all the regulations, you can go to the website. In fact, a lot of our products will point you back to the website and say, oh, if you want to go look at the source code, the law, here, click here, all right? And so, for example, our annotated 
uh, business associate uh, contract. We have a contract that you can just use, ready to go out of the box. We also have one that's annotated that has commentary about, oh, yeah, you have to have this language because of this statute section. If you want to know what this statute section says, click here. It takes you out to the HIPAA Survival Guide, and, you know, we get over 30,000 unique visitors a month, and you would uh, not believe it, but HHS is actually one of our biggest users because HIPAA Survival Guide happens to present the law and the regulations in a Wikipedia-like, you know, hypertext-friendly way instead of digging into various PDFs and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we've taken that uh, uh, functionality and built it into our products to make the law more context-sensitive and available at the place in, at the point in time when you're looking at a, a model security rule and you want to dig deep and say, well, why do I want to do that? Well, here's the regulation that says why, you know, you have to do that. Or in, in, our, in our checklist, uh, almost every checklist item that, uh, you know, that we have, ref there's a reference, clickable reference back to the regulation that, so that you can see why. Why, are, why, is this, why does this checklist item exist? It's driven by, the, it's driven by uh, a regulatory requirement, and here it is. Click, click on it, and you can get it. Martin, anything else? No, that's it. All right. Well, uh, thank thank you for uh, thank you for listening. We do these uh, on a regular basis on the third Thursday of every month, almost without exception. It falls on the third Thursday. But the way to keep up is uh, register with our newsletter. We Martin has a list of all the registrants of, of this uh, webinar, and we will be sending out the slides. You guys uh, apologize for not having them uh, available um, while you were listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. We'll, we'll just blame Hurricane Irma for that one. All right, Martin, you got you got control, so you can stop the recording and uh, we can uh, we can go. Thank you very much for listening, guys. Good afternoon.